for people who have both the psychological and the financial resources to take a risk where both the outcome and the timing is uncertain, uh, it, it is precisely in names like the smaller ones that you will see tenfold gains, twelvefold gains, fifteenfold gains. Oh, it's good, farmers. My name is Antonio, and uh, you know what? Both me and you are probably sick of these intros. Like you've read the title, you've seen the thumbnail, you know what time it is, you know what's going on. And uh, Rick, you've now become a regular on the channel uh, on the farm, for which, by the way, I'm extremely grateful. And and I also wanted to take the second here to thank you on the farmers' behalf. There have been numerous comments under our previous interviews asking me to personally thank you for taking the time to be here for them and for me as well. So yeah, many thanks for being here, my sir. We're truly lucky to have you. That's well, kind of you. I've enjoyed the process. With that said, though, pleasantries aside, Rick, let's jump right into this with the most topical side of the market today. I was looking at my phone earlier, um, and uranium is just going through the roof, right? And naturally, with the stocks going through the roof, uh, or at least increasing quite a lot, let's call it that, um, you get the news about, about, uh, about companies tapping shareholders for money. Right. Uh, for example, Deep Yellow has just, uh, you know, <laughs> the news of Deep Yellow tapping the market, the shareholders for money has just hit the, hit the news, mainstream media this morning um, at the day of recording of this video. But, you know, they're not the first ones to, to tap the market for cash after having their stock run. I guess that's natural. And I don't think they'll be the last one. So what do you make of it right now, Rick? Well, those are all astute comments. Uh, I think in the near term, relative to the uranium price, that the uranium equity markets is, are probably overbought. Uh, you are seeing the uranium company managements, as you suggest, tap the market. Denison uh, tapping the market, uh, Deep Yellow tapping the market. Uh, this is something that we talked about three months ago. We said that they would all need to finance this cycle if the uranium price didn't go up. What happens, let me rephrase that, what might happen in the near term is that the flood of issues coming from issuers onto the market could, I'm not saying it will, but could exhaust the marginal demand that has made the share prices go up. Hmm. This could easily be an intermittent trading top. It is important that your listeners, as they come to understand the market, uh, come to understand the structure of the uranium market which is to say that all of us, myself included, follow the spot market because the spot market is where the, where the uh, trades are posted. Well, the contractor term market is opaque, and that's where 75% of the trades take place. My belief is that if we don't see a follow-through in the spot market, which is to say if we don't see the published quotes for uranium trades go higher, that we are in the process right now of putting in an intermediate trading top. Hmm. The recovery of the market itself will be much more complex. Both Kazatomprom and Cameco have said that they will not restart suspended production until they have enough volume from the mothballed mines uh, contracted for in the intermediate and long term to earn a reasonable return on capital employed. Uh, if you see Kazatomprom restarting mothballed production, uh, or if you see Cameco restart Cigar Lake or MacArthur River, then you will know that the game is on in earnest. <laughs> the art, of course, will be to time your own uh, additional speculation before those restarts occurred. This is a very long way of saying, for those of your listeners who are traders, uh, we are, I, I shouldn't say we're in an intermediate top, but we've come so far so fast in this market. Uh, and, and with the companies themselves issuing stock, this might not be a bad time for a trader to take uh, profits. Hmm. Uh, for investors, uh, we haven't begun to see the fireworks that you look for in the uranium market. While I recognize that three months doubles are very, very, very good, uh, I, I might sound very old and very arrogant, 
uh, but I wasn't here for a double. Uh, I, I was here for a much more dramatic move than that. Uh, that isn't to say that if uh, I have a couple of stocks in my portfolio that I think are less attractive than others, that I wouldn't take profits now and shift the position up market to better quality names. Uh, but certainly your, your leaders, readers and listeners who are new to this market uh, who have enjoyed in the smaller names, uh, 100% moves, 150% moves, might want to, as an example, sell half their position so they recoup all their capital and have the other half for free. Yep. Uh, we call this uh, sort of jokingly, tongue-in-cheek, the point of no concern, uh, meaning if you put uh, you know, 10,000 euros or something into a market, and you recover your 10,000 euros, but have a position left over, you're playing on the house's money. Yeah. We use the term point of no concern to differentiate it from losing money, which is the point of no return. <laughs> so uh, that's, a that's a technique that some of your uh, listeners might want to pay attention to. Whatever happens from here, my suspicion is in the next three to four years, your listeners who have had the courage over the last four to six months to be in the uranium market uh, we'll be happy. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with that. And uh, something that you said last time when we were talking, I think it was about gold miners, but it, it applies here as well. If profits were given to you too easily, then you should take them and, and also mm -hmm. upgrade your holdings. Right. It's like upgrading your business. Something that a lot of people fail to understand is that you're owning a piece of a business when you get more money in that business gets more get gets more richly valued you will upgrade your business going to a bigger business and then upgrade some more and, and on and on and on that i think is how in the long term real wealth is created uh from what i've understood from you um so w would you would you think though that uh, let's say if a capital raise season is kicked off because of these things uh, because because of, uh, because of the top right now would you then say that we'll mostly see prices dropping or do you expect a correction in valuations in the short term as well uh it is very possible that if in the top you know 10 junior names you saw five or six of them finance uh it's entirely likely that for three or four months the financings themselves will use up all of the marginal demand in the market. And if the market begins to lose its momentum, uh, then many of the speculators that give that market liquidity might exit the position. So it's, uh, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's not unlikely that you would see a, a three or four month plateau, uh, or even a plateau where you saw the names decline by 20 or 25 or 30% as the momentum came out of the market and the speculators exited it. Make no mistake, these companies had to and have to finance. The way that they survive until 60 or 65 US dollar uranium is by having enough cash in the treasury that the management team can feed itself uh, and conti can continue to advance their projects mm -hmm. so that there is something to beneficiate when the market itself returns to solvency. I have very little experience with uh, dealing with institutions myself. So I was wondering, what about institutional money though, Rick? Do you think that the institutions that are likely <clears throat> to ever get into something like uranium are mostly already in right now, or are they waiting to join a party for that possible plateau? The financings that you're seeing now are largely institutional. Uh, as an example, the deep yellow financing uh, the money that John Borshoff is raising right now is largely institutional money. The money that Denison raised <clears throat> uh, last week was institutional. By the way, the Denison raise, from what we understand, was eight times oversubscribed. Uh, they went out to raise 30 or $35 million, soft-circled uh, almost $200 million before they stopped taking indicative orders. Uh, those are institutional flows of money. Uh, you are going to see, if this capital availability continues, uh, companies with 30 or $40 million market capitalizations go to market. That will not be financed by institutions. That'll be financed by living, breathing human beings, uh, retail. But in direct answer to your question, there's a lot of institutional interest around the uranium space. Hmm. Uh, the, 
the grizzled old veterans that I know uh, from the last uranium bull market uh, have all looked at the uh, fuel cycle, the fact that a whole bunch of utilities around the world need to commit, that they have long-term contracts which have rolled off and they're filling in the spot market. They've all looked at the fact that we're coming into, in 2021 and 2022, a new fuel cycle, but many of the players that I saw in the last market, the institutional players, have decided that this is the time that they have to be involved. Absolutely. I, but it was, as, as we were speaking about institutions, I just remember something that my farmers will probably lynch me for it if I don't ask you that. But, you know, obviously you've seen what happened with Silver Squeeze. And now all of a sudden there's uh, talk about uh, uranium squeeze, especially when, uh, when prices are going so high and, and on and on. So, you know, I, I don't, again, I don't know much about how institutions deal with that. Uh, I don't think there is, I don't think this market works in a way as silver that it could be, uh, that it could, could be squeezed like that. But what is your take on the uranium squeeze, Rick? Well, certainly, um, squeezing in the physicals market wouldn't work. Uh, the fiscal market isn't liquid enough. Uh, there isn't enough short interest. Uh, and if there is short interest, it's more of a carry trade, uh, which is to say that uh, players have entered into long-term contracts on the sell side, and they're filling part of the long-term contracts out of the spot market. Similarly, uh, there isn't, from my own point of view, enough of a short interest in the uranium stocks to make an equity squeeze work. Now, if these financings continue, uh, you may see a short interest build up in the uranium stocks. But what I do think that you have been seeing for the last three months is it resembles what happened in GameStop stop, and resembled what happened in silver which is to say that there's a whole generation of speculators, your age more than mine, who are much more narrative oriented. And the narrative around a short squeeze, which is to say 500% profits or 1,000% profits, yeah. uh, is in one way very similar to the narrative around uranium, a very small market that based on momentum can't merely go higher but can go much higher. So my suspicion is that on the margins, the liquidity provided in the short squeezes and the liquidity provided in the junior uraniums uh, is coming from a new buyer, which is to say your generation. Fresh money. I absolutely like that. And besides all that that we just said, is there, is there something that has changed? Is there anything in the uranium thesis that we discussed back in the summer of 2020 uh, has something changed in the uranium thesis for the better or perhaps for the worse? I, I think the most important thing, uh, I, I, I remember back to our first visits, uh, and I said, this will take time. And nine months have elapsed. So some of the time that we talked about that would be necessary for the term market in uranium to develop uh, has in fact passed. <laughs> and the term market is developing. Uh, when I think about what's changed in my thesis between now and two years ago, uh, what happened is that two years, two years ago, I said this might take two or two and a half years to take place. Well, the two and a half years or the two years have, has elapsed and it's beginning to take place. So the most important thing that's happened, I think, since the first time we visited in the early summer of 2020, uh, is that nine months has gone by and the market has become progressively tighter. The other things that have happened, in fairness, is uh, we talked about the fact that major producers would likely uh, at least do soft or warm shutdowns, uh, and that's happened. Uh, Cameco has shut down its most important production, because Adam Prom has shut down its most important production, uh, and that is beginning to be felt in the market, both because Adam Prom and Cameco uh, had some of those volumes contracted in the long market, uh, which they are filling in the spot market. And the consequence of that is that the spot market is getting tighter. Uh, so probably the most important thing that's taken place is that the time that you and I described as being necessary for the market to firm is beginning to pass. The risk <clears throat> for the time value of money, that's something that um, you actually brought up. I, I got into researching it more and more and I saw how important it is, especially if you're trying to be a contrarian um, or if, if you are a contrarian, you're investing in these small markets that still need to move. 
uh, we are not dealing with it as much as we deal we used to uh, back in the in the summer of 2020. So that's a that's an awesome point. And uh, yeah, I think that about that about clears the, the the recent happenings. And you know, if there's something that I missed, obviously farmers always have my back. I'm sure they'll be adding something to it in the comments. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that aside, Rick, I um, you know I wanted to get your non-binding opinion. And when I say non-binding, and I actually mean it, by the way, farmers watching this, me and Rick Rowe, we're not your financial advisors. Uh, not, that's not just a disclaimer, by the way, to, to cover my back. It's, it, I don't know your personal situation. Rick Rowe does not know your personal situation. So don't <clears throat> trade off recommendations of the internet. Rather, do your own analysis and do take your personal, uh, personal situation into account, please. But Rick, back to you. Uh, I wanted to get your, as I said, non-binding opinion of some of these uranium stocks that have... Uh, well, a lot of them have hit social media pretty hard. And, and, and also, I, I've got three stocks on here that probably nobody's ever heard of. Uh, but before that, you, you have a grading system that, that people can actually take advantage of <clears throat> for free. So please tell me more about that and, and how does it all work? Sure. Uh, I um, am happy to rank individual investors' portfolio on a 1 to 10 basis. This is not, as you suggest, investment advice because I don't know these investors in, individually. I am only ranking the holdings in their portfolio on a, a, a risk to reward basis. That is to say, the prospective reward has to be much higher for me in a small company. Uh, and I, I rank them one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. And I comment on individual issues uh, if I think that my comment might have any value at all. Uh, I did 22,000 rankings in the year 2020, uh, which has been immensely rewarding. I've helped, I, I would say, probably thousands of investors and speculators begin to understand the process uh, of making money or avoiding losing money in, in natural resources. I've had some wonderful conversations, and they're non-esoteric conversations. Uh, they aren't about sort of big picture narrative. They're rather about people's own individual wealth. And people tend to pay more attention uh, when the stakes are high. In other words, uh, the easiest way for me to teach investment and speculation is by focusing somebody on their own portfolio. So I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed this process a lot. Uh, note that um, the bias reflected in this rankings is my own. Uh, I, I take uh, facts and opinion from everywhere, particularly, of course, from the geoscientists and financial analysts that work at Sprott. But the conclusion aren't sprouts, uh, they're rules. Uh, and they might reflect the bias of an old, fat, rich, bald speculator. Uh, so your listeners will have to understand the ranker's bias. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, in the process now uh, of upgrading the whole rankings database, a process which I suspect will be done next Sunday. So any rankings that we talk about today are subject to rather immediate change. Uh, okay. the, the process of going through the news, the financials, the quarterlies uh, with my team uh, in a database that includes almost a thousand names is a pretty daunting circumstance. In fact, it's never over. I can only imagine. I, I like what you just said there. Just always consider the source. People also obviously ask me questions in the comments. And when I answer, it's me answering, right? So consider, consider right. the source in both situations. Uh, but Anyway, let's put that let's put that one to ten scale to work by uh, starting with some of the sure. some of the bigger names of the uranium market. First of all, obviously, Cameco. Uh, so tell me, Rick, how does Cameco score with you at the current price around uh, what's that sixteen, almost seventeen dollars actually today? Yes, I've dropped Cameco from a four to a five, uh, recognizing the increase in share price uh, without any sense that. Uh, Cigar and MacArthur will restart. Uh, nothing wrong with Cameco uh, at all. It's just up 30 or 40 percent in price over the last few months. So I've dropped it from a four, uh, which is a buy, uh, to a five, which is okay to own. Okay, interesting. Interesting. What about some of the, uh, you know, larger names are always interesting to talk about. So Exxon Prom and, and China Nuclear. But I was also thinking, I came across BHP. Uh, so what do you think about companies like BHP <clears throat> that have the ability to produce uranium as a byproduct of, of copper or something else entirely? As you point out, BHP's uranium, uh, the cost of production is zero. 
because it's offset by gold and copper sales. Now, it's important to note that BHP is not a uranium company. Uranium is not important to BHP, although BHP is important to uranium. That's an important distinction. So buying BHP because it is one of three or four companies globally uh, that is a behemoth in a range of natural resources, coal, iron ore, copper, pick one, uh, okay. is not a bad strategy. I have BHP ranked as a four, uh, and I would frankly have it ranked as a three if I wasn't as concerned about the level of iron ore prices as I am. I'm concerned that a major part of BHP's free cash flow is unsustainable. Hmm. If I viewed BHP purely on a financial basis, I would have it as a three, uh, knocking fairly firmly on the door of a two, which would make it one of my most highly ranked companies in the world, but not as a consequence of the uranium uh, production. Wow. Yeah. When I, when I heard that too, I, I don't think I've ever seen a two among your holdings, but is there, a, is there a large uranium producer among your holdings that gets a higher grade than four? No. Uh, I have Kazatomprom as a four, but it's knocking on the door as a three. Uh, if you see uh, Kazatomprom uh, able to secure uh, enough volume in the term or contract market to begin to restart start some of their facilities, Presumably, although the contract would be opaque, you would see some number around U.S. fifty dollars. Uh, my suspicion is you, that you would see uh, Kazatomprom upgraded to a three, or perhaps even a two. Wow. And it's important to note that Kazatomprom is really the most important uranium company in the world. Uh, it's important to note too that some of the penny dreadfuls in the uranium market will have moves that far outstrip Kazatomprom. But Kazatomprom pays you a 5% plus dividend while you wait uh, and is probably the most relevant uranium stock on the planet for those who can afford the political opaqueness of Kazakhstan. Yeah, absolutely. There was a question, by the way, last time when we talked about Kazatomprom. Somebody asked, where would Americans buy it? Because I can buy it on the London Stock Exchange under KAP, uh, I think. I, I, don't, I don't own it, but I think that's a ticket symbol. So where, where do Americans buy Kazatomprom? Uh, Americans should buy it on the London Exchange. Uh, it is possible to trade it in the U.S. over-the-counter market, but the U.S. over-the-counter market uh, is more opaque than the uranium contract market. Uh, Americans who don't have access to a broker that can trade in London need to get a new broker. Yeah. I would suggest Sprott, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Period. No, I'm serious about that period. Uh, I, you know, I get contact and they're like, well, this stock is not on Weeble or Robinhood or whatever. Well, then you need a new broker if there's a stock right. that's not on there and it's a fairly big company. I mean, come on, because Adam Prom. So, um, yeah, talking about Americans, though, one of Americans' favorite companies on, on social media is uh, Energy Fuels. They call themselves America's leading producer of critical minerals. All right, that's a big, that's a big claim, right? <laughs> And, and when I say critical minerals, I actually like it because there's vanadium in there, there's rare earths in there, and obviously uranium, right? Which are all things that we definitely need for this green revolution and electric vehicle craze. So uh, what do you make of energy fuels? Let's broaden the discussion to the whole uranium, the junior American uranium sector. Uh, Americans like Belgians or Germans or South Africans are ethnocentric. Uh, we're interested in stories that concern ourselves, and Americans are just the same. Uh, America's uranium industry is tiny, uh, at least in terms of production. And, and really, on a global basis, it's irrelevant. Um, we are the world's largest uranium consumer, but we're an infinitesimal producer, and we're high-cost producers. The American uranium story is narrative, and narrative is important if you're a trader. So the various junior companies that either do or purport to uh, produce uranium in the United States or threaten to produce uranium in the United States are their own subset. <clears throat> the uranium industry has managed to coerce Congress to subsidize it, uh, which is highly amusing to me, given the disfavor that uranium finds itself in around the world. So for those of your listeners who are prepared to trade a narrative, and trading narrative is a, it can be very profitable if you're good at it. The whole American uranium subset is an interesting place to be because the largest equities market in the world is in the United States, and Americans, like everyone else, are ethnocentric. I personally don't buy companies 
that are in the worst cost quartile worldwide. Uh, and I think that uh, American companies probably distinguish themselves as a class uh, by being uh, in the worst cost quartile uh, worldwide and probably in the worst capital efficiency quartile worldwide. Uh, in the near term, in a uranium bull market, what happens is that the narrative is more important than arithmetic. And pardon the pun, but I think these stocks are probably explosive uh, on the upside. Uh, Energy Fuels has an interesting range of assets uh, and uh, an interesting range of contracts, which has enabled them to stay in production. Uh, I believe that staying in production was a mistake because I believe that they should have fulfilled their contracts uh, out of the spot market and left their reserves and resources in the ground. But the truth is, uh, in the near term, in a narrative-driven market, none of that matters. Uh, full and fair disclosure, uh, I don't own uh, energy fuels. Hmm. Interesting. What about some other companies in North America like NextGen? NextGen is a stock that you almost have to own. Uh, that is a, an absolute tier one deposit. It's a jewel box and it gets much bigger. The knock against NextGen is that the general administrative expenditures within the company is, are too high. Uh, and the company has done actually too much work in the downturn beneficiating the project. Uh, the project was already a tier one deposit. And the right thing to do in a bear market when you have a tier one deposit is nothing. Uh, anything that you do that causes you in particular to have to raise equity dilutes your shareholders' interest in the deposit uh, for gains that will be uh, realized perhaps at a much later date. So, uh, yes, I own NextGen. No, it's not for sale at this price. Uh, it is... Uh, by all odds, the best undeveloped deposit uh, on the planet, uh, although because Adam Prom may have something in his hip pocket that they're not talking about. The bad news is that that deposit is probably 300, 350 miles away from any infrastructure. Uh, it will be expensive to develop uh, and likely will need to be developed in conjunction with fissions, much smaller, but also tier one deposit simply because of the synergies that would be involved building a deposit 350 miles away from any infrastructure. This is truly in the middle of nowhere, uh, and the time and capital that it will require to put in production uh, will be daunting. Uh, two, the recent decision by the Canadian government to forbid the Chinese state-controlled miner Shandong from buying the TMAC deposit means <clears throat> that uh, there's at least a suspicion around the world that the most likely buyer uh, of NextGen's deposit, uh, which would be the Chinese, is an unlikely outcome. Uh, and if you constrain the range of buyers uh, to Canadian companies, you have the odd circumstance where one contender would be Denison, which is in fact smaller than NextGen. Uh, you know, in effect, the... Uh, the minnow swallowing the fish, uh, or Cameco. Uh, and it's very difficult to have an auction where you only have one bidder. So I'm not trying to say that there aren't warts around NextGen, but NextGen is a superb deposit. Despite those obvious warts, I have it as a four. Oh, yeah. I, I had NextGen mentioned uh, before our call, I guess, in, in, um, in the summer. I really like it, and definitely so because of the ownership that they have in ISO energy. I liked ISO energy and that's how I got to next gen actually. And then I saw that they own them and uh, got me liking it quite a lot. But you just mentioned Denison. Now that that's an interesting name, a public's favorite for sure. It's a lot up on social media and I'm looking at it now. It's up, it's, it's up like crazy today. And so more than doubled actually since the beginning of the year, I, I guess almost. Uh, so what do you think is moving that company and, why is it happening? I think, I think that, well, a couple things. Um, they have two nice discoveries that they're working on. Uh, and unusually for a junior, uh, they have uh, cash flow, uh, in particular from their share of the McLean Lake Mill. Um, importantly, too, uh, Denison's backed by the Lundin family uh, of uh, Switzerland. The Lundines being one of the most successful uh, multi-generational natural resource finan uh, finance families on the planet. And the fact that the Lundines control 20% of Denison certainly enhances its appeal. 
What's interesting about Denison is they went out to tap capital markets last week. Uh, and I think they, to they told the story very, very, very broadly. My understanding is that the marketing effort uh, occurred uh, in many time zones around the world. And as I say, demand for the offering was eight times supply. So what you're seeing in the market now, I think, is institutional investors who hadn't been as aware of Denison as they might uh, otherwise have been, mm. that uh, uh, came to understand uh, the thesis in the marketing, but were unable to satisfy the, their own demand for stock uh, and have begin, begun to fill in uh, in the secondary market. Clearly, with the money that Denison raised, they won't need to return from our, to the market for 12 to 14 months. So the institutions know that the only way that they're going to participate in the enhancement of the assets occasioned by this financing will be to buy in the secondary market. I like the fact that um, it, it's fundamentally backed. And uh, I also, I, I talked to a person today, this morning, who's active in the uh, natural resource sector, but he mostly does private placements to uh, acquire his uh, ownership in companies. And he couldn't get his hands on uh, Denison uh, on, on the on the on the placement. It was just uh, it was too oversubscribed, and they wanted a, a minimum uh, you know a minimum investment, and it was too high. So there's a lot of serious people going into it as well that are probably <laughs> not planning on selling within the next year. Um, probably okay. I'm just speculating here, just saying. Um, but talking about uh, you know about tapping the market for money, as we said, DPLO tapped the market for money. Uh, the news hit the market today. And uh, we know John Borshoff, uh, we know that he's the guy who's given you the, the wildest ride of your career uh, in the natural resource sector. So what do you make of, of, uh, of his current venture? Um, you know, I'm very fond of John personally, separate and apart from the fact uh, that he made enormous contributions to both my net worth and my reputation. Uh, separate and apart from that, I believe him to be a superior human being. Uh, I'm thrilled with his success, and I'm uh, a actually delighted that he used this period of market strength to add to his treasury. He didn't wait until the company was on its last gasp to raise money. He, did, he also, it's important to note, despite the fact that he's probably 70 years of age, didn't use the strength in deep yellow prices to offload his own position, but rather put the money in the treasury. I... If I have a criticism of Deep Yellow, it's that I wish that they would use their relatively strong share price uh, to amalgamate. Uh, this is the time for the market leaders, the Deep Yellows and the Denisons of the world, to uh, buy for stock their smaller, less liquid competitors. This is the point in time where you build larger, more liquid entities with lower costs of capital. Uh, I have been fairly public. This isn't me uh, criticizing Mr. Borshoff behind his back. I've had this conversation with him face to face. Uh, I would very much like to see Borshoff grow deep yellow via amalgamation. Because the Borshoff franchise itself is worth something in the market, there is an expectation that in the transition from bear market to bull market, that John Borshoff himself is a master of that transition. Uh, he seems very focused, uh, as he should as a successful explorationist, in developing uh, his exploration uh, in Namibia. Uh, I would be interested, as I say, in him growing by amalgamation and spreading his expertise over a larger asset base. I have exactly the same comment with Denison. I, I think it's likely that they use the Treasury in exploration. Uh, I think it's likely that if they do an amalgamation, it will be uh, largely, and it should be largely, a share-driven transaction. Mm. There are uh, precious few people who have hung out in the business for the last three years that would like to be cashed out now. Mm. Uh, all of us who are involved in companies that might be amalgamated would, be, would prefer to own shares in the resultant entity so that you can participate in the upside with more liquidity rather than being cashed out at what most of us in the space see as the likely dawn uh, of a fairly interesting bull market. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Interesting way to look at it. Uh, by the way, for the, for the farmers watching this who were not sure about it, um, the vehicle that actually um, 
made uh, a big portion of Rick Roll's net worth and reputation was uh, Paladin Resources. It was with John Borshoff himself, but his previous venture. If I'm not mistaken, Rick, please correct me if I'm wrong. But do you think that Paladin Resources is still worth the time to study, even without Mr. Borshoff in it? Yes, I've upgraded Paladin from a six to a five. My concern about Paladin is that their uh, operating subsidiary has too much debt in it. Uh, the debt holders thus far have been fairly friendly, uh, but I don't like uh, having balance sheets that aren't generating free cash encumbered by a secure creditor whose claim on the asset is ahead of mine. So I don't have the courage to own Paladin at this juncture. Uh, uh, frankly, a circumstance that if the uh, uranium bull market continues, I'll regret. It's precisely those companies that have very obvious warts uh, that can't attract uh, old pawnbrokers like myself that exhibit the most leveraged upside in a bull market. But that notwithstanding, you have to be true to your discipline. And my own discipline is when there's an existential threat to my existence, which is to say too much debt, uh, irrespective of what I think the upside might be, I don't buy the stock. That's a very interesting way to look at Paladin. I don't, I don't own it too. Different reasons, I guess, but still. Uh, what about Australia? We're not talking too much about Australia. Well, uh, there's other Australian companies like um, Bannerman Resources, for example. You know, uh, what, a $150 million company? And they just went through an, uh, an almost 10% dilution as well. To It's true to fund their, uh, what is it, Entangle <clears throat> project. Uh, how do you score them? Huge regard for their CEO. Um, you know, one of the young leaders. Um, the deposit for me is too low grade uh, and doesn't hold together well enough. So while I like the company and it does well with leverage at higher uranium prices, uh, I'm less attracted to their project than I am to other projects. So I have Bannerman as a five, uh, a five because the project passes the test in terms of size and the company passes the test in terms of the CEO who I think is one of the real rising stars in the business, but I don't own it. Yeah, that's, that, that was something that I was going to say. His, their CEO is really well-spoken. He's out there constantly doing interviews. By the way, I'm going to try and get, get him for an interview uh, anytime soon. And I, uh, I actually do like their CEO quite a lot. That's what, gets ben, that's what makes Bannerman so interesting to me. But with regards to their project, you're absolutely correct. Uh, so talking about these smaller companies, um, I'm not sure how, how big of a fan you are to African projects, but what about companies like Global Atomic? I really like this company, by the way, as first of all, they, got, they, they, they can secure cash flow from their business in Turkey and they can invest it over in uh, Niger. Is that something you do like? We are, uh, as Sprott, large shareholders of Global Atomic. Uh, I have it as a five, uh, which is generous. Um, in a normal circumstance, I would have it as a six for the following reasons. The Turkish cash flow, while it's useful for offsetting GNA, is small. The market won't ever care about it. Uh, it it's, an interesting, um, it's an interesting fundamental because it allows them not to dilute. Uh, the, uh, the Roman family who control it uh, have a different company. Uh, as well uh, in the gold business uh, and the fact that they have uh, divided calls on, on their time and attention I think is a major negative <clears throat> and Niger is a real challenge uh, while I like the deposit I like the grade I like the tons and I love the exploration upside uh, when you talk about political risk Niger defines political risk the sociology of the country with uh, warring tribes and clans that go back a thousand years, uh, the allegations uh, that Niger is one of the most corrupt administrations on the planet, uh, and the ongoing insurgency in the north of the country, fundamentalist uh, Islamic insurgency, well, really it's tribalism masking this fundamentalist uh, insurgency, means that Niger is a particularly difficult place uh, to do in particular exploration. When you are like Orano, the big French concern, and you put something in production, you have a hard target. 
and the insurgents are much light, less likely to come after a producing mine, particularly when it's surrounded by French paratroopers. Uh, Exploring in conflict zones is uh, dangerous, difficult, and expensive. There have been three times that I can remember in my career where exploring in conflict zones uh, has related ha has resulted in the murder uh, of an employee of a company that I owned. Uh, and to say that it's traumatic understates it. By the way, what you said, um, dangerous, difficult, and expensive. There's a funny thing when you're traveling through Asia, just to break the, the, the mood here. Uh, when you're traveling through Asia, you can choose it to be either cheap, comfortable, or fast, <laughs> but you can only choose two, and it can never be three of these things. Right. So when you say dangerous, difficult, and expensive, you can only choose it to be uh, two of the opposites of those three. It, it can never be all three of these uh, things. Right. But when it is, that's a project worth looking into. I think that's a good point to make here. Mm -hmm. um, Great. Yeah. Anyway, let's do one last before I go into these uh, really small companies, small names that I don't think anybody else is uh, talking about. But I was also thinking about Boss Resources over in Australia. I, I don't have a position in it, but I might be looking for one very soon. The only problem I have with that company is that uh, 200 plus million dollar uh, market cap. So do you think it's already fully valued or? I don't. Uh, I have Boss as a four. Nice. Um, it is only the incredible escalation of the share price over the last 12 months that keeps it from being a three. Uh, this is a first-class deposit in a first-class jurisdiction with great infrastructure, a management team that understands the deposit well, a, a management team that understands mining, mine construction, mine finance, and mining capital markets. This thing has everything going for it, except uh, it's doubled. <laughs> um, you know, uh, the top quality team, uh, I, you know, I'd like the deposit to get a little bigger, but I'm uh, certainly receptive to the sense that it can get bigger. Yeah, first time I heard about it was, uh, it's actually a, a, a fellow YouTuber who brought it to my attention. Shout out to Deep Valley Co, great, great channel, small channel on here on YouTube, deserves yep. to be way bigger. Uh, but he, he, you know, he got my attention to it and I didn't buy it. So I, I don't yet own it. I, I find it. Uh, yeah. It's, you know, to, uh, I got to do some more work to get myself to pull the trigger, uh, even for a small position to, to take a small bite off it. Uh, but what you said is definitely noted. I appreciate your opinion on it. Uh, I'll now move into some of these, uh, lesser known names to, to, um, well, they, they might be interesting for people looking <clears throat> for opportunities in the uranium market right now. Uh, and let's start with uh, Marenica Energy. I don't think I'm pronouncing it correctly, but I never do. So uh, this is a $25 million company, uh, but it's also doubled in price in the last year. And it's got assets in Australia and Namibia as well. So uh, do you know this company and how, how, what do you think about it? I do know it. Uh, I have studied it, but I don't know it well enough to rank it. I don't believe that my opinion has any value relative to other commentators that are more deeply immersed in that company's affairs. Do you think that there's enough information out there to do a decent research on it? Because I'm also struggling I do. with finding. I, yeah, I do. I do. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, I'm, I, I, haven't, I haven't done enough work to comment. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. I appreciate that. That one, by the way, came from James from the Discord server. Uh, another smaller one that James was asking about earlier and one that I actually very much like is forces metals probably not saying it correctly again but forces metals uh so if i'm not mistaken that's uh like a 70 million dollar company probably more by the time of recording of this video again very small but their project uh which is by the way <clears throat> it already has proven and probable reserves for the farmers that didn't know uh it also holds a mining license already it's in namibia as well it's very very close to rio tinto by the way it's an open pit you know rather simple yep. It's a rather simple project that is, that is, is it, it also has a very low EV to NPV ratio, even still. Uh, high insider ownership, I like that. Tight share structure, I like that. They've got some share, uh, they got some cash on the balance sheet, I, about a million dollars or so. I, I like that as well. So, uh, have you studied that one, Rick? Of course, as well. Uh, I've known, I know the former owners and managers there. I don't own it uh, because I'm concerned about the grade of the deposit. Uh, and I'm, concerned about the capital intensity relative to the free cash. Uh, it is precisely the kind of stock that if you see the uranium price go to 60 or $65, will scream because the 
the amount of uranium in the ground, irrespective of grade, which is to say the in situ resource that they have, provides the kind of leverage that makes speculators salivate. Uh, I don't own it, but it is one probably because they're running on fumes. Uh, and my suspicion is that forces will finance in the market sooner rather than later, which might be my entry point. Nice. Very, very, very well said. I really, really like that company. About 100 million ounce, uh, ounces. Oh, my God. I'm still thinking about silver. About 100 million pounds, pounds of uranium right. in the ground there. Pr proven probable. Great, great reserve in, in my opinion too. Um, and the last one that I wanted to get your opinion, the last small one that I wanted to get your opinion on um, is Baseload Energy Corp. It's, it, it's actually now trading at about 40 or so percent discount to its 52 weeks high. So unlike the majority of these stocks that we talked about today, <laughs> this one is actually not at its 52 weeks high. So what, what do you give that one? Baseload is another one that we've looked at, but I don't know enough to suggest that my comments would have any value. So I don't rank it. Hmm. Do, do you think that these small companies in general are worth studying or uh, as a speculation, obviously? For the right speculator, they are absolutely worth studying. It's, I think it's difficult for somebody of your generation that wasn't around to experience the last bull market in uranium to understand the magnitude of these moves. <laughs> Um, I gave this statistic uh, in the middle of last summer in an interview that you and I did. <clears throat> but following the last bear market in uranium, there were only five uranium juniors worldwide that survived that bear market. Uh, in the ensuing bull market, the poorest performing of those five generated 22 to 1 returns. That's not 22%. That's 22-fold returns. We're in a circumstance now where there's probably 30 or 35 remaining uranium juniors. Uh, and probably 10 or 12 of them are uh, reasonable speculations. I don't think that the dimension of this bull market will be as exaggerated as the last bull market. But I still believe that it is much more likely than not that we will see an important bull market in uranium. And for people who have both the psychological and the financial resources to take a risk where both the outcome and the timing is uncertain, uh, it is precisely in names like the smaller ones that you will see tenfold gains, 12-fold gains, 15-fold gains. Understand that in order to play the game, uh, you might still be a year and a half or two years early, or you might ultimately be wrong which is to say if you had 10 or 15,000 euros in place, you might lose 5,000 euros or 8,000 euros. The alternative might be that you turn 15,000 euros into 150,000 or 200,000 euros. Mm. Uh, so for people who are willing to do the work and are psychologically prepared for the volatility associated with that, these are important um, opportunities, mm. important speculative opportunities. Nice. I appreciate that. By the way, you just said that you don't think that the uh, uranium market is going to be uh, as explosive as it was last time. And there was this, uh, there's this chart that a friend of mine uh, tweeted, retweeted actually, Yellow Boo uh, on Twitter, by the way, shout out to him. And uh, in this chart, um, it, it's a chart from WallStreetCheatSheet.com, a website. They actually explain the feelings in the market that appear as, the, as market fluctuations. So, you know, the market goes through a disbelief. We saw that greatly in the uranium market. And a hope, optimism, belief, thrill, <clears throat> euphoria. And then it starts going down to uh, anxiety, denial, panic. And then it goes into anger, depression, and disbelief again. So on that scale, where would you say uranium is at right now? I have no idea. I'm not ducking the question. It's just that um, narrative is not my long suit. Mm. Uh, we've talked before about the fact that I don't even own a television set. So my ability to understand the impact of a narrative on a market uh, is only driven by history. What I can say is that the last uranium bull market drove some important discoveries, which are as yet undeveloped. And as the uranium price returns to the level where the industry is solvent, there is an unusual number of projects that can be brought into production, particularly the Kazakhs. They can't be brought into production quickly. 
But with the last bull market, we didn't understand where the supply would come from. Hmm. Now we understand where the supply will come from. Uh, the last bull market, we took the uranium price from eight US dollars a pound to about 150 US dollars per pound. Uh, it is likely, in my opinion, uh, this time that we take the uranium price, I'm talking about the spot price now, from say $30 a pound to 75 or $80 a pound before the market evens out at 60 or $65 a pound. Okay. When you begin to bring um, uh, next gen and fission, uh, but much more particularly because Adam Prom back online, uh, you have the ability, admittedly with a time delay, a financing delay, a construction delay, uh, you have the ability to adequately supply the market as we see it today. The only reason that I could be way wrong is if we see an economic recovery on a global scale that outpaces a recovery that I see in the cards. If you had a circumstance where, as an example, the world export economy increased and the Japanese had to restart their remaining 34 shutdown plants uh, and the seaborne liquefied natural gas price doubled, which is what happened uh, the last time Japan needed to generate electricity without uranium. If you had that circumstance, if you had a much broader based economic recovery than I see, and, and hence demand for power, baseload power uh, increased, then in the near term, you could see the uranium price going higher than I've suggested. I don't see that in the cards, but it's important for your listeners to know that I'm a credit analyst. I'm not an economist. Hmm. I appreciate that. I, I, I still do appreciate that. I really think that those are wide, wise words. And you just talked about some of these uh, undeveloped discoveries. Is there any companies that we didn't go over in this video? Any uranium companies that you think uh, I and the farmers are missing and should look into? I, I, there's a flawed one, Fission, uh, which just raised some money. Um, the deposit that they have is next door to NextGen's deposit. And I think that the deposits probably get built at the same time by the same person. This is a bit challenged because traditionally there's been uh, antipathy. I think that's a polite term uh, between the managements of the two companies. They should actually be one. Uh, and the general administrative expense at Fission has been too high. There's not enough insider ownership at Fission. Has a lot of strikes against it. Uh, but it is a tier one deposit that's next door to a giant deposit. <clears throat> and I think it gets built. Hmm. Uh, getting away from the trading narrative, uh, getting to uranium as an investment, uh, I, I think we need to say that the most important company in the world, bar none, is Kazatom Prom. Uh, and if you have a uranium portfolio and you don't own Kazatom Prom, then you're trading narrative rather than reality. One that we didn't talk about, uh, which I think is uh, well run, but has some political risks, is CGN Mining, China General Nuclear. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I am impressed with the management team there. I am very impressed with their mutually beneficial series of joint venture relationships with Kazakhstan, where the Kazakhs increasingly uh, have access to low-cost capital from China, uh, and the Chinese have access to long-term uranium supplies. From my point of view, a win-win circumstance. Uh, both China and Kazakhstan are uh, countries that give many Western investors pause, uh, which I think is the reason that the share prices for both CGN Mining and Kazatomprom lag on a fundamental basis. Their Western counterparts. How do you buy uh, CGN actually as a Hong Kong trades on the Hong Kong exchange? Uh, you know, in this day and age, uh, people that don't avail themselves of a broker that has pretty global access. That is to say, if your broker can't buy stocks in Hong Kong, uh, if you can't buy stocks in London, the United States, Canada, Australia, get a better broker. Uh, the idea that you are more concerned about commission expense than you are access to high quality companies 
is on the face of it, one of the dumbest um, investment philosophies I've ever seen in my life. In other words, I'm not going to buy the best companies in the space because it might cost me $6, $60. I'm going to spend $10,000 on a crummy company uh, because I can do it for no commission rather than pen, spend $10,000 on a great company because it would cost me $60. Hmm. Uh, this is almost the definition of insanity. Yeah. It absolutely is. Two things that I wanted to see here. First of all, these free brokers, they will cost you money when it's time to sell. Some, maybe, maybe it's going to be less than what you would pay for like a legit broker, but they will cost you money in, in terms of the spread. That's, that's mostly how absolutely. they make money. First of all, I mean, you know, if, uh, if you're looking at a product or service that's free, you need to understand that you're the product. Uh, in the case of the Robin Hoods of the world, what they do is very smart. They sell your order to a market maker. So as you say, you pay for it in the spread and you pay for it in the currency transaction. Uh, buying stocks through, as an example, the people that we do, the Royal Bank of Canada, uh, we get a fairly narrow spread between, as an example, US dollars and euros. Uh, but it's very common uh, for the so-called free brokers to charge a 200 basis point currency spread. Yeah. So although you pay no commission, uh, you pay uh, 200, per, well, not 200%, you pay 150% of the currency spread that you ought to pay before you're paying the spread uh, on the market. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. So if you compare it to a low-cost broker like Interactive Brokers, that's the one that I use because mm -hmm. I have a relatively small portfolio. Uh, in the end, it, it's not even worth it not to use Interactive Brokers. I do think that it's important for people to stop for a second and think about themselves. Like, are you going to be serious about this investing thing or is, just a, is it just something that you do because it's that time of the year where you're not allowed to go out, right? right. Think about yourself. And if you think you want to get serious about this, think about a decent broker, a, a real broker, not something like Rogan Hat, uh, I guess. Uh, yeah, Rick, as always, wise words on everything, my sir. I really appreciate you. I really value your time, and uh, I'll, I'll leave you to it now because of that, but not before I've thanked you. So uh, thank you for taking the time to be here. Again, I really appreciate it, and I look forward to f future discussions. Well, always, uh, always a pleasure to visit with your listeners on any topic, including uranium. Remember the rankings. The site is sproutusa.com forward slash rankings. I will rank your natural resource portfolios, uh, comment on those companies where I think my comments might have value. Uh, and I look forward to the process. Mm. Thank you. When farmers, you already know it, but no video can go by without me plugging the farming community on Discord. Not because I'm getting rich off it or anything like that, and, and, and I'm buying Lambos and, and PhDs, but you know, because it's generally a good community. Uh, there's about 250 serious investors on there. And, um, you know, you know that they're serious, by the way, because they're either paying to be there, like paying actual cash, uh, or they've actually proven themselves to be of value to the community. So I've given them uh, free memberships and free access. Uh, so yeah, on there on the baby farm community, we talk about different things, uh, stuff like dividend investing, growth investing, resource investing, obviously, and, uh, and the occasional swing trade as well is also shared on there. Uh, you can see all of my uh, portfolios, demo, real portfolio, everything is on there. Uh, you can also join by visiting the Patreon link below uh, in the link this video. And if, if you want to learn, but you cannot spare the couple of dollars each month, I absolutely understand that. Don't, don't feel pressured by that. Just keep watching these videos. I very often actually give out opportunities to win a free membership for life. Okay, so anyway, just stay tuned. Keep on watching that. And with that said, I'll leave you with the simple message as always. Do not only look at the numbers, but see, but the, see numbers. the numbers.